Well, take your Bible tonight, go to Luke chapter 9 with me if you would please, Luke chapter 9. And we are going to begin reading at verse number 23 of Luke chapter 9, Luke 9 and verse 23. <clears throat> Luke 9:23 and he said to them all if any man will come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me for whosoever will save his life shall lose it but whosoever will lose his life for my sake the same shall find it for what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself are be cast away. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this evening. And Lord, as we open up your word again and study it together on a Wednesday night, and again we look at tonight the cost of discipleship, the words that you spoke here and recorded in the other Gospels as well about those who would follow you and the, what it would cost them to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us tonight to, even in our own mind, go back to that day and as we look at the Scriptures, as we read what you said, as we expound upon what you said, May we see ourselves sitting at your feet and hearing you say these words to us and help us to be followers of Jesus Christ, faithful disciples of our Savior. So bless our study this evening in Jesus' name, amen. All right, Luke 9 and verse 23, we're talking about the cost of discipleship. Discipleship, you have to understand, is not limited to the twelve. Okay? You remember, if you recall, we, um, we talked about how many followers Jesus had. There were times there were multitudes that were following Him. We know on one occasion there were 5,000 just men. And they were hungry and the Lord had them sit down and He fed them. We call it the feeding of the 5,000, but it very easily could have been the feeding of 10,000 or 15,000 that day. Many followers. And I want you to notice in... Verse 23, notice it says, He said to them all, if any man will come after me. So he's not just talking to the twelve. They're included in that all. But he's talking to all of us. All of those who are listening to him. So don't, don't look at these, the, the cost of discipleship and say, well, that was for those twelve guys. That, that certainly doesn't apply to me. Uh, no, it applies to us guys. Okay, uh, usins, and uh, it's, it's all of us who need to be disciples of Jesus Christ. He said to them all, I want you to notice first of all, the priority of the call, of the cost, the priority of the cost. The first thing he said, when he said to them all, he said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Very first thing that Jesus deals with is this a matter of self-interest. He said, you will not be able to be a follower of me and a follower of self. You will not be able to do that. Either Christ rules your life or you rule your life. It can't be both. You either do what you think, what you feel, and what you want, or you desire to do what God thinks, what God feels, and what God wants with your life. So when you look at deny, we understand a little bit about deny. The Bible says in Titus about we are to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and live godly and soberly in this present world. When we deny, the word deny literally means this. It means to disown. It means to refuse or neglect to acknowledge. So I'm refusing to neglect, I'm refusing to acknowledge, I'm going to neglect me. Well, what about how I feel? 
What about how? Well, you know, what about what I think? See, and how often do we catch ourselves saying, "Well, I just don't think this is so," or "I just don't see what's so wrong," and we catch ourselves where we're 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 fighting for who's on the throne, who's ruling my life. Is it is it self, or is it Christ? But all who would enroll in the school of being a disciple of Christ must first deny themselves. It's the fundamental law and the first great lesson to be practiced. Sadly, most believers today give very little indication of dying to self. You can't get most to deny themselves to go to church three times a week. They'll, they'll maybe get a Sunday morning for an hour. But you see, to get back to church on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night, that's a denial of self. For there are many other things to do that we enjoy doing that would take us away from being with the people of God. Denying self. If it's not convenient for some to go to church, they just don't go. And I know I'm talking to the Wednesday night Wednesday nighters, okay? Look at Luke chapter 9, a little bit later in the chapter. Go down to verse 57. It came to pass, as they went in the way, a certain man said to him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. You know what he's saying? He's saying, I want to be your disciple. Jesus said, remember back in verse 23, if any man will come after me. Well, this guy's saying, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Jesus said unto him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. But he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And he said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell which are at home in my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Notice in verse 59, the man said, I'll follow you. And, or Jesus said to him, follow me. And he said, Lord, suffer. What's the next two words? Me first. I have those words circled in my Bible. The same is in verse 61. Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go and bid them farewell, which are at home in my house. In other words, Lord, I want to follow you, but it's still me first. And you can't follow Christ if it's me first. You, still, you can't be a follower of Christ if you're not denying yourself, if you're still allowing self to rule over Christ. And to rule, follow yourself, if you, if you try to follow Christ and follow yourself, you're going to fulfill verse 62, you're going to go back. You're going to look back. And you're not fit for the kingdom of God. Wow. You see, God has designed that there's boundaries that he, we live within. In the Garden of Eden, He gave Adam and Eve much freedom within. About, in fact, He gave them just two boundaries. You don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And of course, you don't eat of the tree of life. You live forever. That's it. All the other trees they could have. I, I think probably it had all those 12 manner of fruit that we'll see in heaven one day. I think it was a perfect environment. And they had all kinds of freedom if they just stayed in that boundary that God made for them. But they violated God's boundary. What happens when there's a boundary and you want to walk through somebody's property and they have a, they have a fence up and that you walk on their property, they usually have a sign up there that says, no what? No trespassing. That means you violated the boundary. 
You're not supposed to violate the boundary. That's why the Bible calls when we sin, it's a trespass against God. We violate God's boundary. Where's our freedom? Inside the boundaries. What do you have to do to stay inside the boundaries? You've got to deny yourself. You have to say no to self. When your self wants to do things that are outside of God's boundaries. It's interesting. It, there, there's only freedom in the boundaries. You get outside the boundaries and you'll be in bondage. It's interesting, isn't it? How when you go to the world and you talk, the, the world tells you this. Well, well, here's what you need. You need more self-esteem. You need more self-respect. You need to look out for your own interests. You need more self-reliance. You need a better self-image. Self, 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 self. And you come to Jesus and the first thing He says is, deny yourself. Don't even acknowledge yourself. Now you'll see how this fits in in just a minute. That's, listen, that's not the way to get a crowd. Want, want, want to get a crowd? Want to, uh, if you want to get a crowd, you tell everybody to have self-respect and have self-esteem. And let me tell you, you can be the best you that you can ever imagine. Huh? And, and, and if, I, if I slick my hair back and put my fingers like this, you know, I could probably get a big crowd. But that's not what the Bible says. He says, deny yourself. But it's more than that. Number two is the pain in the cost. The pain in the cost. Look again at verse 23 of Luke 9. Jesus said unto them, He said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. Take up his cross daily. So, well, Pastor, what does that mean? Let me tell you what it doesn't mean. Okay? Tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that um, it's just a burden to put up with. We, we have all kinds of, there have been kind of sermons and preaching about, well, it's just my cross I have to bear. Like it's something that's been thrust on me, and I guess I got to carry it. And they, they talk about a burden. It's just my, it's some trial or some hardship that I just have to put up with. It's my cross. That's not what he means. Other people say, well, that cross is having to deal with difficult people. You got a hard boss to work with, or you got a difficult mate to live with, and you say, well, that's just my cross to bear. No, it isn't. That's not what he's talking about. Well, it's just dealing with tough circumstances. That's not bearing your cross. When Jesus said, take up the cross daily and follow me, the disciples would have understood that because of the day in which they lived. That's, a, that's imagery that they would have been able to picture because they've seen men carry their cross to the place of crucifixion. Romans have crucified people. They've seen that happen. And they've seen, as they will see Jesus in a few years, carry that cross to Calvary. Criminals carried their cross to the place of crucifixion. The cross is not something forced upon us. It's something we willingly take up. Take up your cross and follow me. Let me give you three facts about the cross. Three facts about a cross. Number one, it's a place of suffering. It's a place of suffering. We, you know, it, it was the method of execution, you understand. And it was an awful way to die. We, you know, it wasn't something that people wore around their neck as a decoration. It'd be like you and me wearing a, you know, a, a uh, you know, an electric chair or something hanging around our neck. People think you're a little weird, man. You're wearing an electric chair, you know. Uh, that's, that's what it would be similar to. It was a place of suffering. It was an excruciating way to die. Extremely agonizing and painful way to go. Jesus, I think, is saying, listen, fellas, if, if the cross involves suffering, if you're unwilling to suffer physically in order to be my disciple, you cannot be my disciple. 
there's going to be some suffering involved. It's funny how people will suffer in to, to play sports and hurt and go through injury and still go back and want to keep playing. But boy, if somebody suffers a little bit for Jesus or for the cause of Christ, they'll say, well, I'm not doing that again. Or it's quiet in here. They'll complain all the time. I mean, listen, we, we can come to church on Wednesday night, like last Wednesday night when it was pretty warm in the auditorium, and we say, man, it's warm in here. Wow, I, I can't believe it. I'm sweating or I'm fanning. But, but they'll go sit in Ohio Stadium for three or four hours on a Saturday in 90-degree sun. And they won't complain a bit. They'll say, this is great. Think about that. Those same people will say, well, it's awful hot. I'm not sure we'll go to church today. <laughs> it's a place of suffering. Something else about the cross, it was a place of shame. Remember what the Bible says about Jesus in Hebrews 12? It says, Jesus, we look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross. What's the next phrase? Despising the shame. And is set down at the right hand of God. A shameful thing to be hung on a cross and bear the reproach. You were, you were, you were hung out there in front of everybody. Naked. To, embarrassed before the world for the crime you committed. It was a place of shame. You know the world? What did they do to Jesus on the cross? Yeah, you saved others. Yourself you can't save. Hey, if you're the Son of God, come down from the cross. Well, they mocked Him. Made fun of Him. People ever made fun of you for being a Christian? People ever mocked you for your faith? Are you willing to, to bear some shame for Jesus Christ? That's part of taking up your cross. That's what that means. That's the only thing the cross was for. A place of suffering, a place of shame, a place of sacrifice. A place of sacrifice. What's a cross used for? To die on. Now we find out the Lord isn't just saying deny yourself. He's saying die to yourself. I didn't die. Jesus, Jesus didn't die on the cross to get a better me. He got it to be a debtor me. Now we're not called physically to die. Some are. The disciples would be. Every one of them, except for Judas, of course, who took his life, would, would be martyrs for Christ. But it's not physical death God's calling us to, but He is calling us to die to self. And we take up that cross when? Daily. Every single day. That's why the Apostle Paul said, I die daily. I take up that cross and I die daily. Sacrifice. What, what sacrifices have you made for Jesus Christ? That's, that's tough. I, I was dwelling on this and you know, as American Christians... What really do we sacrifice for Jesus Christ? It's humbling when you go to India, isn't it, Brother Dave? It's going to be humbling when you go to Uganda and see what these people sacrifice and know all that we have. It's, it's we don't have much cross-bearing, much followers. Years ago, a guy wrote a book, and I remember reading it. It was, uh, it was called... Uh, was it called Not a Fan? 
And he, he makes the emphasis in the book, are you a fan of Jesus or are you a follower of Jesus? I'm afraid we've got a lot of fans, but we don't have many followers. What Jesus is looking for is followers of Jesus Christ. If any man will come after me. We'd, we'd, our, our, our American Christianity, we'd rather it said, uh, take up your cushion and follow me. That's what we'd like it to say. Cross. Rough, splintered piece of wood that's only for suffering and for shame and for sacrifice. For me to die to myself. Yeah. That's what he said. That's the, and, and, and by the way, all of that is painful. But we don't ever hear somebody say, well, God wants me to go through some pain. For him. We always say our society pains the enemy. You go into the hospital for anything and they'll have a numbered chart there and say, tell me where your pain is. One through ten. Zero to ten. If it's anything above a certain number, well, here's a pill coming your way. We don't want you to be in any pain. But you're missing maybe what God wants to teach us through pain. Take up your cross daily. Number three, the pursuit in the cost. Jesus said, if any will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and what's the last two words of the verse? Follow me. What is it? Follow me. So the, the denying of self and the dying to self isn't just to punish the flesh or punish the body. We're not just into, hey, just, uh, all right, I'm hard on myself. No, that's not the purpose. The purpose is so we can follow Him. There's a reason for this. It's to follow Christ. Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. We put a lot of conditions on that. So what do you mean? Well, some people say, well, I'm going to follow Jesus but as long as I can, I can do it in safety. In other words, safety. I'll follow Jesus if it's safe. I'll follow Jesus if it doesn't cost me my friends, if it doesn't cost me my reputation. I mean, if I'm not going to be put in harm's way, then I'll follow Jesus. Other people say, well, I'll follow Jesus if I can still have comfort. I'm, I'm going to follow Jesus as long as it's comfortable. As long as it doesn't cramp my style. As long as He doesn't impose too much on what I want to do with my life. As long as I don't have to give up too much. As long as I can maintain my lifestyle. As long as it doesn't get, out of, get me out of my comfort zone. I'm good with following Jesus. Others say, well, it's time. T-I-M-E, I'll follow Jesus if it fits in my schedule. After all, I'm pretty busy, you know. I've got, got a busy schedule. As long as it doesn't require too much of my time, man, count me in. Other people, it's entertainment. Well, yeah, I'll follow Jesus if I can still live my own life and still do the things I enjoy doing. I mean, sure, I'll, I'll add Jesus in. But I, I still want to have the time for my entertainment and enjoyment, my hobbies, my sports, my recreation activities, the things I like to do. Other people say it's security. Well, I'll follow Jesus as long as He won't pull the rug out from under me. I'll follow Jesus as long as uh, I can have a secure future. I mean, I don't want to have to, I don't have to just take things by faith or anything. <laughs> I, want to, I want to know that I'm okay and I'm going to have a house and an income and uh, land and I've got to know all that's out there for me. Do you see the, see the stipulations we put when it comes to following Jesus? 
But I want you to notice this. Notice the faithfulness in following Jesus. When Jesus says, follow me, it's no part-time job. It's not, it's not a Sunday, Wednesday thing. It's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's right on through. It means Christ will have first priority in my life. It means that there will be a, a, an emphasis and an urgency given to the things of God, to the commands of God, that what God says and what God desires for my life, that has first priority over everything else. That's faithfulness in following. What's our focus in following? The focus in following is we're to follow Christ. Follow me, he said. If I'm going to follow Christ, I've got to keep my eyes on Christ. How easy is it when we get our eyes on others? Or get our eyes on our circumstances? And when we get our eyes on other people or we get our eyes on other circumstances, that's when we have difficulty following Christ. What? You know, well, so-and-so did this. Well, so-and-so said this. Well, somebody did this to me. What has Jesus done to you? When Peter got all concerned about John and told Jesus, well, what, what are you going to do with John? John 21, you read about it. What are you going to do with him? What are your plans for John? Jesus looked at Peter and said, what is that to you? Follow thou me. And don't worry about what I'm doing with him. You do what you know God is having you to do and you keep your eyes on, you, on Christ. Don't keep your eyes on other people. That's your focus in following. Number C is the forsaking in following. If you're going to follow Christ, it means you have to forsake other interests and activities. It means everything else has to take a back seat. In your, when you get married and you have marriage vows, you, you make the statement, forsaking all others, and you give yourself to this one. I mean, uh, what, what good would it do if you say, forsaking all others, and the, and the groom stands there and says, now wait a minute. I don't think I'm quite prepared for that. I mean, I love this girl, and I'll, I'll give myself to her, but I'm not ready to forsake all these others yet. How many brides think that would work? Yeah, I'll wait. I'll give you a minute. No, that's right. That ain't going to work. But somehow we think it's okay with Jesus if we do that. We let the littlest things keep us from time with Him or gathering together with His people. All these things come up and we think, they're, oh, they're, they're so valid and they're, they're such a, a good reason. But we have to understand when we follow Him, we forsake others. When the twelve begin to follow, remember, they, for, they forsook all and followed Him. They walked away from it. There's some things you just got to walk away from. You, you, you walk away, hey, you walk away from the ball games on Sunday when you're going to follow Jesus. There was a day when, when there were pro athletes like Billy Sunday who said, I won't play on Sunday. And he wouldn't play. That's before he left to become an evangelist. He took his stand and said, that's the Lord's day, I'm not playing. You see, we, we've lost that. We even have a Christianity today where, well, you got planned Sunday, just slip in an hour service Saturday night, get God out of the way, and then you have Sunday to yourself. There was a church years ago up in Canton when we were up in that area. They had billboards to advertise their Saturday night service. You know what their billboard was? A guy sleeping in bed saying, now you can sleep in Sunday mornings. Saturday night service at 6 to 7. Forsaking. D is the fatigue in following. Following Jesus will not be an easy task. It's a war we're in, not a picnic. You'll have opposition. Paul reminded us in the book of Galatians, be not weary in well-doing. 
Now, if He warns us not to get weary in well-doing, I suppose we can get weary in well-doing. And let me tell you, my friend, you certainly can get weary in the work. But you do not have to get weary of the work. And there's a difference. And so you rely on the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit to help you to do the work that God has you to do. Now I want to point something out to you. When Jesus says, follow me, the word follow here means to take the same road as another. To take the same road as another. And the idea is not that we're following behind somebody, but that we're accompanying someone. Like they, like they walked with Jesus on the road to Emmaus. They weren't walking behind Him. When you, walk, when you go down the same road as somebody, you don't go single file. You go side by side. You, you, you're in the company of another. We're accompanying Him. Remember Mark 3.14 when He called the twelve and He chose twelve? He said that they might be with Him and that He might send them forth to preach. Remember the two requirements? They have to be with Him. So the follow me is to be with Him or to accompany Him. The reason many do not follow Christ is because they're not really interested in His company. On television recently, there was a report on something they called the New Vegetarians. One lady they had on there said this, I usually eat vegetarian, but I really like bacon. True story. This program said she represents a growing number of people who refer to themselves as flexitarians. Most of the time, they refuse to eat meat, but once in a while, they'll make an exception. This woman explained it this way, I really like vegetarian food, but I'm not 100% committed. Flexitarian is a good way to describe how many people view their commitments today. In other words, I'm committed until it becomes inconvenient or uncomfortable. A lot of people approach their commitment to Jesus Christ in the Bible that way. Hey, I want to follow Jesus and I want to, I, want to, I want to live for Him, but don't ask me to forgive that person. It ain't happening. Well, yeah, I want to follow Jesus, but release that bitterness and resentment? No way. Well, follow Jesus, sure, but wait a minute. Give, give 10%? What? That ain't happening. We want to be flexitarian Christians. I'm sure that's not a term, but it just became one. We, we wear the name Christian, but then we want to pick and choose what we want to follow and what we don't. As if the Bible was a buffet and we can kind of take what looks good and leave the rest. But Jesus Christ is not looking for half-hearted followers. He has no interest in Sunday-only Christians. In fact, if you're lukewarm, Revelation tells us what happens to lukewarm Christians. He spews you out of his mouth, and I think we're all adult enough in here to understand that means you make him puke. So Jesus is basically saying, fellas, hey, you know what? It's all or nothing. And I know, man, you hear this and think, whoa, man, this is big, this is, this is, this is pretty heavy stuff here. But I'm not telling you that. I'm telling you what Jesus said. 
So your issue is not with, boy, that church down there, man, they're really heavy. No, 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 no. Your issue is with Jesus Christ. He's the one who put these guidelines down. I didn't. I'm just the messenger. Telling you, this is what he said. Is it not? Did you not read what I read? Following Jesus Christ is not something you do part-time or most of the time. It's full-time. All the time. With all your heart. It's all or nothing. The last thing, number four, there is the payoff to the cost. The payoff to the cost. For this, I want you to look over to Matthew's count of this, okay? Will you do that? Uh, Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Are you doing okay? Are you all right? Matthew 16. If you, just to make sure you understand, we're in the same, the same conversation. Jesus had just Matthew's recording of it. Uh, look at verse 24. Then said Jesus to his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Same wording as Luke, right? Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Now verse 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of His Father with His angels. And then He shall reward every man according to His own works. You know what the payoff is? He's going to reward every man according to His own works. Jesus is coming. Hey, I know, I know, I, I've been in church all my life, literally. Literally. Saved when I was six, but I was in church before I was even saved. And I mean, I probably chewed on the nursery crib and cut my teeth. And uh, I was in church. All, and I've heard it all my life that Jesus is coming. And it's easy to say, oh, there it is again. Yeah, I heard it again. Yeah, but one of these times, we're going to be right. And, and I know this. I don't know when He's coming, but I know we're closer now than we were last Wednesday night. And, and He's going to return. That's a surety. That's an absolute certainty according to the Bible. That He will come again. And He's going to come in the glory of the Father and the glory of the holy angels. And the, He says over in Luke, if you were ashamed of me and my words, in fact, look back at Luke chapter 9 and see what He says there. In verse number 26, He said, Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when He shall come in His own glory and in His Father's and of the holy angels. He says, I'm going to reward those who've served me, and, and uh, th those who have not, they're going to be ashamed. They're going to be ashamed. Can you be ashamed that it's coming? Absolutely. Absolutely. In Matthew, he says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father which is in heaven. And if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father which is in heaven. I don't know what all that means, but I sure don't want to be on the denying side. I don't want to be part of that. That's why he said that what does a man gain if he gain the whole world and loses his own soul? What can he give in exchange for his soul? What does he do if he loses his life? He's saying the only way that, and Matthew said, if you, if you save your life, you have to lose it. And if you lose your life, then the same will save it. I'm, I, listen, we lose our life because people... People look at us and think, man, you go to church Sunday morning, go to church Sunday night, go to church Wednesday night, you live for God, you read your Bible every day. What kind of life is that? Can I tell you? It's a great life. And, and I'm not about this life. Say, what do you do for fun? I'm having fun. I, I, the truth is, the best is yet to come. This isn't what our life's all about. We're here to live for God and to reach people with the gospel, to reach people for Jesus Christ, to seek and to save that which was lost. But our, our listen, the, the payday isn't here. The payday's over there. That's what we're living for. We're gonna, I'm going to have a spell when we get to heaven. Okay? We're going to have a great time. Don't, don't think heaven's just... 
Oh, well, what's fun about sitting on a cloud playing a harp? That's, that's the world's idea of what heaven's going to be like. Not going to be like that at all. That's why we give ourselves to the cause of Christ. That's why we deny some of the so-called pleasures of this life. That's why we, em- we embrace the things of Christ and reject the things of the world. I'll lose my life in order to gain the life in Christ. I have more than what this world would ever offer in Christ. Oh, does the world have pleasure? Sure, but the Bible says it's only pleasures of sin for a season. There's always sorrow that comes with it. I don't care for that. It's coming a day when we'll all stand before God. And how do you want to face God? There's a song that says, By and by when I look on His face. Beautiful face, I think thorn Shadowed face, by and by when I look on his face, I wish I had given him more. More, so much more. I don't want to stand before him and say, boy, I have regrets. Wish I'd have done that. I wish I'd have done this. I want to stand before him one day and say, I'm so glad I did live the way I lived. William Borden, 1904, graduated from a Chicago high, high school. He was heir to the Borden Dairy Estate. As a high schooler, he was already a millionaire. For his high school graduation present, how about this? His parents gave him a trip around the world. There you go, Nathaniel. You'd like to send him around the world, wouldn't you? <laughs> Well, his parents gave him a trip around the world. So he traveled through Asia, the Middle East, and Europe. But when he did, he got a growing burden for the world's hurting people. And though he was converted to Christ at a young age, Borden wrote home to say, I'm going to give my life to prepare for the mission field. And at the same time, he opened his Bible and he wrote in the flyleaf of his Bible two words. He said, no reserves. No reserves. And he held nothing back. During his college years at Yale University, he became a pillar in the Christian community. One entry in his personal journal that defined the source of his spiritual strength simply said, say no to self and say yes to Jesus every time. Say no to self and yes to Jesus every time. During his first semester at Yale, Borden started a small prayer group that would transform campus life. That little group gave birth to a movement that spread across the campus. And by the end of his first year, 150 freshmen were meeting for a weekly Bible study and prayer at Yale University. Borden's senior year, 1,000 out of 1,300 students were meeting in such Bible study and prayer groups. Yale. Borden strategized with his fellow Christians to make sure every student on campus heard the gospel. But his real passion was missions. He narrowed his call to the Kansu people in China. And upon graduation from Yale, Borden then wrote two more words in the flyleaf of his Bible, and it was no retreats. No retreats. In keeping with that commitment, Borden turned down several high-paying job offers and enrolled in seminary instead. After graduating, he immediately went to Egypt to learn Arabic because he intended to work with the Muslims in China. But while in Egypt, he contracted spinal meningitis. And within one month, 25-year-old William Borden was dead. But prior to his death, Borden had written two more words in his Bible. Underneath the words, no reserves and no retreats, were the words, no regrets.
It's only, look at me now, it's only if you follow Jesus Christ with all your heart. And you follow Him denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following Him with no reserves and no retreat that you'll stand before Him one day with no regret. That's a disciple of Jesus Christ. May God help us to be that disciple. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, thank You for this evening. Thank You, Lord, for Your teaching on discipleship that You spoke to not only the twelve, but to all of them that listened. And You've spoken to us tonight. Lord, I pray that each of us would take very seriously whether we really are a disciple. Am I really a follower? Or like that fellow said who wrote the book, am I just a fan? I pray that there would be a passion in our heart tonight for each of us to be followers of Jesus Christ. Help us to be true disciples. Now, Lord, dismiss us with your care. Make us mindful you go with us from this place. And may we go with the message of Christ in our hearts and on our lips. Help us to tell people about Jesus. I pray that we'll have opportunity and make opportunity to lead others to faith in Jesus Christ between now and the Lord's day. Help us to be about your business. We love you. Pray you'll use us for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.